Wonderful, wonderful. All right, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and get started. And uh, to everyone on online, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Nitrin Mandala Masterclass taught by Luigi Finocchiaro, also known as Ken Mandara of the Nitrin Mandala Study Workshop, and privileged to be hosted by Nitrin Buddhist Sangha of the San Francisco Bay Area, also known as Nitrin Bay Area, and our head minister, Reverend Rue Michael McCormick. My name is Mark Herrick. I will be your host uh, and moderator for the class. I'm a Dharma teacher and meditation guide with the Nitrin Bay Area Sangha. And I have been practicing Nitrin Buddhism for uh, over 50 years. Luigi Finocchiaro is the author of 26 books on Nitrin Buddhism. Here is just a few of them here on our bookshelf here at the temple. Luigi has a Bachelor of Arts from the Academy of Fine Arts in Florence and a master's degree from Risho University in Tokyo. Luigi has lived in Tokyo for over 25 years, where he's been able to continue his extensive research on the Nichiren Mandala, and has since visited over 60 locations and temples where they are currently preserved. First, I'd like to start with a huge thanks to Luigi for being so kind to do this class. I believe it's one o'clock in the morning, his time, um, so that we could accommodate all the time zones around the world. So, uh, Luigi, really, thank you so much for, for really uh, above and beyond, as we say. Uh, Luigi's work is inspired by two great curiosities. First, what attracts the observer to the Nietzschean mandala with such power? And second, how is it that Nietzschean's mandala transcends every cultural barrier to communicate directly with human nature? Luigi's three-part masterclass on the Nietzschean mandala traces the history of mandalas in Buddhism, starting from the earliest times to Nietzschean Shonen's life and onward to today. This masterclass offers a unique approach to understanding Nichiren's calligraphic mandala that is disentangled from theology. The classes present the calligraphic mandala in Nichiren tradition as an ingenious tool of communication, which not only defined his entire career, but subsequently paved the way to the worldwide spread of his teaching. This masterclass offers all who are interested in the use of mandalas to awaken a detailed understanding of their origins and their construction. Please use the webinars questions and answers feature, the little button down at the bottom, to type a question. Luigi will be taking questions at the conclusion of his prepared remarks. While this class is free, Nietzsche and Bay Area gratefully accepts Donna and donations that help us continue to bring such wonderful study content to you. Should you choose to offer a donation, please visit our website when you have a moment nichirinbayarea.org and click the donate link. We hope you will enjoy the class and that it will inspire you to continue searching and journey in your practice. This masterclass will be recorded and available online on the Nitrin Bay Area YouTube channel. Okay, Luigi, uh, that said, thank you so much. We really are quite grateful. Uh, I'll be sharing the slides on my side of the panel here and uh, begin at your pleasure. Uh, hi everyone in uh, different time zones uh, as mark said uh, it's one o'clock in the morning here in, in tokyo i believe it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning in uh, in california and noon in, in the eastern side and uh, as far as i know there are various uh, countries that are joining this webinar so thanks again to uh, Ryuga, Mark Herrick, and uh, the Shinganji Temple, the Nigerian Shube area, for giving me this, this opportunity to share uh, <clears throat> these presentations. Uh, why I decided to make three uh, presentations uh, is because I had a previous experience with a, with a group in Italy who asked me to, uh, to, to make a presentation about the Nichiren Mandala. I said, no, I'm going to make three, not one, uh, because in, in, in one hour, you, you just have the time to say uh, this mandala such and such is the size is this and this and it's store here and there and you know this these are things that are uh, you can find in my books and you can find also uh, on several websites uh, so uh, I decided to uh, how can I say to enable you to fly with me in, in a way on a sort of a magic carpet or a specious cloud more buddhistically correct to enter a completely new dimension to um, 
experience the, the mandala and Nichiren as a person in, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, I would like to say that everybody has intuitions, so to say. Everybody has their own idea. Uh, but the important thing is also for research to, to become serious, it has to be, you, you have to be confront yourself in an academic research with people who knows much more than me. I, I was fortunate enough to be tutored by uh, um, professors of the caliber of uh, Terao Eichi, who was one of the major experts uh, about the Nichiren Mandala. And I, I had contact with virtually all the, the, the most, the top experts in, in the world. Uh, much than, than I had before. Uh, so maybe I stated something obvious, but uh, I, I, I wanted to say this. So uh, let's start to go to the summary. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to explain about today, I, I'm going to make a, a, a very brief foreword, and then I'm going to start really with, uh, with, with the cave painting and, uh, <clears throat> so to speak, at the dawn of, of, of humanity, in a sense, so, and what is the relationship with uh, with the image and, and sign? Then I'm going to jump uh, a few millennia and briefly talk about the Buddha's image uh, and his iconography and, and the Buddhist narrative and what are the archetypes and in, in iconology. Then uh, I will jump uh, another few centuries and I will... Uh, give you a different perspective on Kukai and and uh, and also and Honen and and the, the mandala the first mandalas that arrived to Japan then I will also uh, try to give a, a, a different perspectives of the arts in the Kamakura period and of the Mappo thought the, the the latter day of the Dharma the defiled age that we are used to to have been presented as, as something where everybody was scared uh, about hell and and it was a very gloomy time which is in fact true but there's also another aspect then uh, we will enter into the core uh, of the research and we try to understand what inspired Nichiren uh, to draw the mandala what were his sources because we we know or we can guess more uh, fairly uh, about the textual sources, of course, because we know that the curricula that uh, Enyakuji, we know what he studies, we, we know uh, from his writings, we know the, 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 the text that, that he read, uh, but we don't know what he saw actually. And th this is also uh, a point that I'm going to try to, uh, how can I say, to discover with you in, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, then uh, I will uh, start with the uh, first uh, mandala that uh, Nichiren draw before going to Sado and the Sado exile. And I will conclude this first session uh, with Sado between legend and reality, also to try to, to give uh, uh, an, another perspective. And this will conclude in this first session. And in the second uh, session, so in two weeks' time, uh, so you will have to time to think of your, how can I say, to let these sediments, uh, how can I say, into your thoughts. And then I will go to the, in the, the core of the research. Uh, and so in, I, I will uh, try to illustrate the entire Nichiren and Mandali corpus. And then in the third uh, session, uh, I will uh, speak about a uh, Hoke identity and in what, what happened in the Mandala world, so to speak, uh, in the in the last uh, eighth century, uh, next slide, please. I would like to to give a, a very brief forward on 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 Buddhism, uh, because as uh, Dr. Jacqueline Stone always said, uh, Buddhism has is, has to be studied holistically. So so good in 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 Japanese, because actually Buddhism is is one, and uh, to symbolize this. The fact that Buddhism is, is one teaching, uh, I, I chose this this uh, rotating sutra cabinet, uh, which was uh, invented by a, a Chinese monk no, uh, known as Fu Da Shi, and uh, he is the patron of librarians and and, and students. Uh, so, why I I would like to emphasize this point uh, because the, the point of the so-called sects or, or schools of Buddhism, uh, 
uh, they were exaggerated in, in during the Tokugawa period because priests were prohibited to visit other temples, to have contact with other temples. So, uh, of course, you know, like sectarian debate, uh, you know, become more and more harsh. But actually, Buddhism, in, in the true sense of the, of the word, it's, it's nothing like, like this, uh, divided in sects. Buddhism is, is, uh, is just one teaching. So we go to the next slide and uh, we go directly to uh, <clears throat> the relationship between uh, image and sign. Uh, man, humankind is the only biological entity on this planet, as far as we know in, in the known universe, that is so obsessed with themselves because animals, uh, plants, they, they, they know what they are. A, a cat know, knows that he is a cat. Uh, but man has always uh, struggling with the question, who am I? And, uh, and therefore he had the urge since the, the Neopaleolithic time, uh, you know, to draw, uh, to, to tell stories, to narrate, to create uh, an, uh, allegories, to create stories, you know, bedtime stories. Uh, this is man just need it. Uh, so I was uh, a guest at the, uh, the master thesis discussion of a, of a, of a friend in, in Florence, uh, an archaeologist, and I was so surprised to discover that men at that time, they did not only paint the inside of the caves, as I imagine, they actually decorated all the whole ambience around uh, mountains, everything what they could, you know, they, 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 they draw stuff, they, they decorate it. So uh, wh why I would like to start with this point, because uh, I had an extensive exchange with Denise schmantz Bessera from the uh, University of Texas. And she wrote an interesting, very interesting book, uh, which is uh, titled uh, When Writing Met Art. And she explained that by the time that, uh, how can I say, pro proto, proto literacy started to appear, uh, you know, like signs, simple dots or lines, such, such as in the, the picture that you're seeing now, uh, also the drawings changed. Uh, so drawings, you know, paintings, depictions became imbued with, with narrative, with a sort of a sy syntax. So you, you can have a syntax also when, when you paint, when, when you draw something. Because it's obvious if I uh, draw uh, something large at the center, so to speak, and, and with peripheral figures, it is obvious that the figure at the center uh, is the most important. And the other figures that are, are around the, the central figure, uh, vary of importance depending on the distance of the of, of the central figure. Uh, so uh, with this emerging of proto literacy, uh, also uh, the way that that man depicts his narrates his story in in drawing in, in artistically change uh, completely, parallel to the development of, of writing. Uh, so uh, after proto literacy, there was an interaction and so uh, we were able so men were able to create a story a narrative because it's obvious if I if I paint a, a bird or a fish it is obvious that you know e even animals can can see uh, you know a scarecrow it's, it's it's not a real thing but you know it scares the crow so the animals have to perceive even animals have the perception of shape and form. Uh, if I draw, uh, let's say, uh, many, many fishes or birds, one next to the other, this is obviously a decoration. But if I, I, I draw a, a big bird in, at the center and a smaller bird around them and another bird who is coming, uh, I'm giving direction. I am giving a story. I giving, I'm giving a dynamism to this narration. And this is one of the first important uh, <coughs> steps to, to create the calligraphic mandala, as we will see later. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, now uh, we, we already jumped another few millennia. And I want to talk about the, the power of image. 
I don't know if uh, many of you are aware that in the first few centuries of Buddhism, the image of the, image of the Buddha was, uh, if not prohibited, uh, there were many people at the time that they thought that the uh, concept of the of Buddhahood of enlightenment is too profound and too difficult to explain. So <coughs> that if if uh, the Buddha is depicted in his human form, uh, there will be a sort of idolatry. So uh, there were many who tried to uh, prohibit uh, to depict the Buddha's image. Uh, therefore, many concepts came out. As you can see here in the pictures, you have the, the chakra, the, the dharma wheel, you have the tree, because the most important episodes in Shakyamuni's life from birth to nirvana, enlightenment and fighting the demons, etc. happened under or in the presence of a tree. So the, the tree, the body tree is a, is a perfect substitute uh, for the Buddha, the, the chakra as well. So uh, in, in those centuries, in those millennia, uh, archetype started to grow into our uh, collective consciousness. And this is very important as, as we will see for, uh, for later, uh, because once archetypes start to go deep in, into our conscience, uh, is it that uh, narration becomes more possible, more complex uh, uh, discourses can, can be explained and, and uh, can be understood. And then I, I would like to say that Buddhism is not something Asian uh, or something Japanese. Buddhism uh, is really a polyphonic work, uh, which is, it is a sort of a chorus, which with singers from uh, from the Greek Empire uh, and to the eastern of Asia, uh, going through Turkey, Uzbekistan, uh, the, the Kushan Empire. The Kushan Empire was is, is somewhere in the middle where today uh, Afghanistan and and the, the south of uh, Pakistan is uh, Kashmir, where actually all the sutras, including the Lotus Sutra, were translated and and took the form. Uh, that we know now. So the form of the Lotus Sutra, with its Myoho Renge Kyo, etc., is actually born in the uh, Kushan uh, Empire, not in, in Japan or in Greece, but along the, 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 the Silk Road. All many thinkers, meditators, artists, poets, they all contributed to what we uh, today know as, as Buddhism, as, uh, as we saw in the example of the uh, ro rotating cabinet. Uh, so the curiosity of man, which prompted him to uh, put his hand on, on ink and, 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 and leave his traces on, on a cave and to paint his story, he is also connected with the curiosity, what am I? What is man? And this is basically the, the, the quest, the, the motor uh, of, of Buddhism. And then we will uh, jump another few centuries and we go to the next slide, please. And I will now uh, go more near to the core of the research. And I, I would like to speak about Kukai. Uh, Kukai, as many of you know who, who read Nietzsche's writing, uh, Nichiren uh, criticized him many times, uh, but it, we we should not take this criticism literally, so or at, at face value, so to speak, uh, because actually, if there were no Kukai, uh, there couldn't have been Nichiren. Kukai was a sort of a let's call it a, some some call it a super genius. Uh, he's the one who. Uh, most probably invented the uh, Japanese kana script, uh, the Japanese kana scriptures, and uh, he was convinced that in the uh, phoneme, in in the in the graphicization of, of the spoken world, the Dharmakaya is is inside, is is dwelling in the phoneme, in in in, in the kana that he wrote, and also in the empty space be between what we write. 
uh, there is the, the Dharmakaya. And uh, Kukai was uh, a person who was really into uh, studying, studying about uh, the written sign. Uh, one of his famous treatises is the Shoji Sogi about sound, sign, and reality, which is something that Nichiren works a lot with sound, uh, sign, and reality. Also, the concept of Sokushin Jogutsu, uh, the attainment of enlightenment in this very existence, is something that comes from Kukai. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, Lucia Dolce has exhaustively explained about the concept of criticism and appropriation. Uh, so Nietzsche criticizes him, of course, because otherwise uh, his school, as we call it today, would have just been a subsect of the Tendai school uh, instead of being a, a completely new teaching. So of course Nietzsche criticizes many of his uh, contemporaries and, and uh, other uh, Buddhist founders, but we should not take this uh, criticism literally. Uh, as I said, uh, it's a criticism and appropriation, not appropriation in the sense that he copied something, in the sense that he truly understood what those people such as Kukai had been enlightened to or had understood. Uh, and then he, he made it his own, he digested it and he made it his own. Here in the picture you see two of the uh, first mandalas uh, copies, of course, uh, which uh, Kukai took with him from his journey to Tang China in the ninth century. These are the uh, Kongo Kai and the Taizo Kai mandala, so the um, uh, Diamond World mandala and the Wo World mandala. Of course, we see this, these are very beautiful works of art, uh, very colorful, uh, but the point is, what, what are these mandalas? The mandala is, is a transformation panel. The mandala is not just an artistic invention uh, to decorate something. Uh, it is basically the text of the sutra transformed into imagery. And this is what the mandala is. The mandala is not an invention of anyone. It is based on the text of the sutra. Uh, so in the case of Kukai, of course, it's the uh, Mahabharata Shana Sutra, so the Dainichi Sutra. Uh, and the, the whole narrative of the uh, Dainichi Sutra is depicted in this uh, mandala. Uh, so I would like to make clear that the uh, mandala is a uh, transformation of text into images. So there's, as, as Nietzsche always ri also writes, uh, this mandala is by no way my intention. Is this the perfect matrix with, with the ma matches the, uh, the original uh, picture? So uh, this is actually the, the concept of the mandala. So uh, this is what Kukai introduced to Japan when he went to in, in search for Buddhism uh, in, in, in Tang, China. So next slide, please. So here we see uh, some hokke iconography and hokke art. On your uh, left, you see something that may sound familiar to the attentive observer. It is a um, hokke hensuzu. It is a, a, a lotus transformation panel, uh, which is from the year 686. And it was the honzon, the focus of devotion at the Hasidira temple in Nara. And if you look closely, you can recognize in the middle, we have our uh, uh, treasure tower, the Jebel Stupa. Then we have the four heavenly kings and the uh, uh, other figures which are into the narrative of, of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, in the middle, you see another uh, Hokke mandala uh, with uh, Sanskrit glyphs and, and some, uh, how can I say, uh, figurative paintings such as you know the uh, uh i mean the the, the treasure tower is, is at the middle and then you see shakyamuni and tau are inside with siddham glyphs and around there are the uh, eight bodhisattvas of the uh, essential teaching and of the trace trace teaching so this is basically already the nichiri mandala then you see you know the, the other picture here these are um depictions from uh, some uh, ritualistic, man uh, from ritual manda um, 
scripts uh, the show son zuzo the kakuzen cho the hazaba show these are all things uh, that were actually at the libraries of Enjakoji and other temples where uh, where Nichiren studied or where he visited so he definitely came into contact with this sort of visual narrative you see here in the in the panel in the in the bronze panel this is all uh, figurative then you see in the middle uh, this uh, uh, this wonderful mandala which is still extant uh, it is hybrid in the sense that uh, it uses glyphs so logographs and then also painting and this mandala it is a little bit uh, uh, one century before prior to Nichiren and it is said that uh, embedded in in the fabric of the, this mandala are the the hair of Hojo Masako. Hojo Masako as you probably know uh, was a famous uh, uh, lady, a politician. She was the spouse of uh, Minamoto no Yoritomo, which uh, uh, you, you find often in, in, in uh, Nietzsche's writings. So by saying, uh, by uh, quoting this detail, I want to say that already in the uh, early Kamakura period already, uh, there were many sort of uh, extreme practices or bodily practices. One of them, uh, for example, to uh, embed your, your hair uh, in, into the fabric of a mandala. This is the, not the only example. There are also other examples of uh, this type of mandala with the uh, hair of the devotee or of the deceased one, uh, which are embedded into the, into the fabric of, of, of the mandala. Uh, so, uh, of course, we have no proof uh, that Nietzsche saw this, those uh, depictions, and neither the other ones that I'm going to show in the next slide. Uh, but in any case, uh, they were there, uh, they were already, uh, you know, available for Nietzsche to see uh, during his times. Uh, so uh, then we go to the next slide. And then I, I want to speak about medieval art and, and Mapo Ford. Uh, you see on the uh, on your left side two sculptures from uh, Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu. These are from the very famous uh, sculpture, uh, sculptor Unke. Uh, Unke was an extremely talented uh, sc uh, sculptor and, uh, and as you see those uh, expressions are very realistic. There's a, this is almost, even if it's medieval time in Europe's time, uh, this were already uh, mannerism, you know, so past Renaissance, so to speak. So uh, the, the Kamakura era was extremely creative on one side. And uh, because of this Mappo thought, there were many extreme practices. For example, when uh, Unke was doing art, so painting or sculpting, uh, there were intensive chanting sessions, uh, either the Nembutsu or, or the Daimoku, which they probably at the time uh, chanted not Namo Myo Renge Kyo, but Kimyo Myo Renge Kyo. This is, uh, we have no way to, uh, to definitely prove this, but we know that there were intense uh, chanting sessions while he was doing art and also uh, while he was uh, copying the, the sutra, the Lotus Sutra or the Diamond Sutra, uh, he introduced this uh, Ichiji Sandai, so uh, one character, three bows. So you imagine you, you copy the 84,000 XY characters of the Lotus Sutra as, as already an extreme practice and you kneel down and then for each, well, after you have drawn each character, you bow three times out of respect. So uh, they, they are also known, uh, you know, like uh, uh, no, noble people who uh, decided to copy the, the whole the, the whole Buddhist canon or the, uh, in the, in the, of course, in during a lifetime or during a couple of, of three decades or even, copy a sutra with their own, using their own blood instead of ink. So these are really uh, extreme bodily practices in a sense. Then you see this uh, beautiful uh, mandala in, in, in the middle. Uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, golden and silver ink on indigo paper. This is actually uh, drawn using logographs. Uh, this uh, treasure tower, which is uh, depicted uh, at the center, is basically an outline. But if you go near, um, if you were in front of it, going near, you see that this outline is actually the text of the sutra written uh, in continuously. So it is basically an interactive mandala uh, because the observer has to, you know, to, to go near and, and, and read the story. Uh, so he interacts with, with the work of art. And here already, uh, together with uh, figurative depictions, because you, you see at the size there are all the parables and the tales of the Lotus Sutra, like the, the hungry tiger, uh, the Kuhn's lamp, and all, all these sort of allegories which are quoted in the Sutra. But the, the tower, the, the, the main uh, object, so to speak, the, the, the tower itself is all made by characters. Uh, Halle O'Neill uh, from Stanford University has made an extensive study in this uh, Kinji Hoto uh, mandala, uh, where she, of course, in her book, she also quotes uh, Nietzsche's mandala as, as also uh, a mandala that uses uh, calligraphy. Uh, so these were very extreme practices. Then I would like to uh, draw your attention on the right you see this uh, uh, calligraphic mandala, probably one of the first in 1214, I think. So uh, uh, almost half a century, uh, more than half a century before Nichiren. This uh, was drawn by the um, Kegon, so uh, um, Flower Garland School. Uh, he was a, a monk named Mioe, so he invented the Gemmitsu, uh, so the Kegon esoterism, so to speak. And he wrote, draw this mandala. Uh, so it is Namo uh, Sobetsu Sampo. So uh, I, I devote myself to the three treasures, so which are uh, the, the Buddha, the, the priest, and, and the Dharma. And you see at the bottom of the central inscription, we have a lotus dice, as also. At, at the bottom of each of, of the of the inscription that we have, because uh, you remember the slide about the, the archetypes and, and, and the Buddha's image and, and the substitute for the Buddha's image. Uh, today, whatever we write or we paint or we, or we depict, if we put a lotus, this exactly this, this figure, the, the, the lotus dies at the in the proximity or at the base, we immediately know this is a Buddhist sacred imagery or a Buddhist sacred script. So this is why also the, those archetypes are, are very important. Then I would like to draw your attention more to the left. And you see uh, between the, uh, the sculpture of, of Unke and, and this uh, 12th century, uh, um, Eisen, uh, ferocious Eisen, you will see what is also a calligraphic mandala. This is called a Rokuji Myogo, so a, a, a six letters uh, 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 sa sacred uh, mandala. This, this was inscribed by a monk named Shinran, uh, founder of the Jodo Shinshu. Uh, Nichiren, uh, they, they were almost contemporary, ne nearly contemporaries, but they did not met as, as, as far as, as we know. Uh, what, what is this mandala? L let's look at it. We have in the middle this Namu, of course, and Amida Busu. Then at the, at the feet, at the bottom, we have this, our uh, beautiful uh, lo lotus dice that signifies that this is a sacred image. And then on top of the bottom, it, there are um, quotations uh, from the uh, Muryojo Kyo, so the Sutra of Infinite Life, which is important for the uh, Jodo, Jodo Shinshu uh, uh, school. So Nietzsche, of course, he did not see any of this. Maybe the, the, the sculptures, maybe he saw them. Uh, but what I want to say is that the, uh, the, the era, the milieu in which Nichiren 
grew and, and, for, and studied and formed itself, it was very uh, fecund, it was ripe for this type of new uh, mandala that he uh, uh, developed to appear, because already uh, these uh, sacred inscriptions uh, were, were already very diffused at, at his time. So now, uh, the next slide, please. I just go back to Kukai for, for a second. Uh, here we have a transformation panel uh, from the, this is the, 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 the Congo Kai mandala in, inside of a Busudan. So this is basically something that some believer had inside of their homes. We see in, 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 in the middle, uh, the most important figure is the, the glyph, the Sanskrit glyph for uh, Dainichi Buddha, uh, which is, of course, the central uh, and, and the most important. And here we have this transformation panel, uh, which is decorative because there are many colors and, and shapes, but there are no anthropomorphic figures here. So already the observer understands through uh, the symbols what he is looking at. As a matter of fact, uh, Nietzsche then asked himself at times, uh, could it be that the uh, Dainichi Sutra, the Mahavanana Sutra, could it be that is a, a wrong or a different translations of the Lotus Sutra with, with the uh, interpolations of mudras and, and mantras? Uh, why he say this? Because uh, the narrative is very similar. Uh, for those who are familiar with the uh, with, uh, uh, Mahavaranshana Sutra, uh, we have points in two points in common, which are, uh, first, there is a transmission. The whole story is, is about a transmission. So uh, in, in the case of the Dainichi uh, Sutra, it's the uh, cosmic Buddha, Mahavarachana, which transmits the teaching to uh, one Bodhisattva, who transmits it to another Bodhisattva, etc., etc. And this happens inside a the so-called uh, iron tower in the in the in the south of in India, so uh, Tenjiko uh, Nan Tenjiko Tetto. Uh, so we have a tower as well, and inside this tower there is a meta time, not our current time. Uh, inside of the uh, uh, iron tower in the southern India past, present, and future are fused together in one meta time, so to speak. So the Lotus Sutra also, on top of, uh, you know, being centered around the tower, also happen in a meta time. So the assembly of the air is not a certain time, a certain location, let's say, like the biblical narrative, you know, like the Last Supper of Jesus and all, all the events that, that we know from the Bible, they happen in a certain place which we can, you know, try to excavate in a sense and, and, and in a certain time. As a matter of fact, the whole Western calendar uh, is basic, based on those uh, historical or perceived as historical facts, but the narrative of the Lotus Sutra and of the Danichi Sutra, they are both in, in a different time. They are not in, the, in, in, in a uh, definite uh, space and, and time. Uh, so Nietzsche, at the beginning of his career, so to speak, he's not much confrontational uh, towards the, the Shingon teaching or towards the Dainichi Sutta as he is at the beginning against the the Jodo school and, and, the, and the Zen school, he appears in his writing to somehow uh, put the, uh, the, the Shingo narrative and the Lotus narrative on a almost equal uh, le level of quality, so to speak. It is then after in the Minobu years, especially in the Minobu years, which we, we, he uh, starts his, 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 he mounts his criticism uh, against Kukai. Uh, but at the beginning, uh, he asked him, as I said before, is he asked himself, for example, in, in, in the Kanji Honzon show, he talks about the Kongo Kai and the Taizo Kai mandalas, so the warm and, and the diamond mandalas. So it means that he has seen them. Of course, we have no proof. As, as my mentor, Ejitera, would say, you don't know that because 
you know, we don't have any holographic writing of Nietzsche where he say on that particular day uh, and, and months, I went to that place and saw this and this. We don't have this. But he's, he writes about those mandalas. So at least he heard about those mandalas if he hadn't seen it. But uh, my educated guess is it is mo most probably he had seen them because they were available at, at Enyakoji, at, at least in, in, in the library. So now I would like to... Uh, go to the possible influences of Nietzsche on the next slide, please. What do we see here? Uh, those who are more familiar with the, the whole Nietzsche and Mandali corpus has already on the left, on, on, on the top of left and right, has recognized two original Nietzsche holographs. These are the Fudo Eisen Kankenki from 1254. So one year after the a commonly assumed uh, declaration of his teaching in, in 1253, he still feels the urge to draw those two depictions of uh, Fudo and, and Eisen. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, these are just some details because the, the whole sheet, uh, many other uh, writings where he write, uh, this is Nietzsche and the 33rd uh, esoteric uh, uh, successor of Dainichi Buddha, something like that. So, of course, again, we don't have a proof uh, that he received some esoteric transmission or that he saw uh, or what he saw. Uh, but Lucia Dolce has, has uh, uh, written that Nietzsche had probably received many uh, esoteric transmissions. And if you see here in, in the middle, uh, these are some almost identical in a different style depictions uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Fudo. Uh, this, these were made by Enim, so a successor in the in the uh, um, Enyakuji, uh, but whom, of course, uh, Nietzsche criticized uh, the great master Chisho and, and, and Chicago, so Enin and Enchin, he criticized them as well. But we know, of course, and uh, Jacqueline Stone also uh, wrote about it, that Nietzsche didn't draw much uh, of, the, of his narrative uh, from those two uh, priests. And if we look closely, what do we see in the, in the drawing of, uh, of Fudo made by Enin and Nietzsche? We see the same symbols. We see Fudo in, in the same pose with the same uh, flame, uh, fl flamery here, uh, bearing the same sword. So this is the the uh, the, the uh, Hoken, the, the sword of the Dharma, which uh, cuts illusions and defilements. We have our uh, rabbit here or hair uh, bec because. At that time, it was believed that uh, even now Japanese say that uh, there the, the is a rabbit or two rabbits on, on the moon. Then we have this 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 uh, man here in a, a sort of a, a government official attire, uh, because we know that uh, the good governance was a and a very early interest of Nietzsche and before uh, writing the Rishon Kokoron, which of course has to do with, with uh, governing the state with a good governance, he wrote a few essays about uh, what is the what is the correct way uh, to, to, to lead a country, to, to govern a country. Then we see here on the uh, right uh, the, 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 the Eisen dep depictions and uh, we know that Fudo and Eisen are not part of the Lotus narrative, but nevertheless, they are present in almost every Nishiri mandala, in, and not even with uh, uh, Sino uh, Chinese logographs, but with the Sanskrit logographs. So, even more, so to say, drawing uh, on the Mikyo, on, on the esoteric narrative. So, Whoever studied a little bit of art knows that in art there's nothing casual, there's nothing decor decorative, so to speak. So uh, if we look at each of the details which are depicted in this, uh, both in the uh, Fudo and in, 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 the, in the Eisen depiction, we see, for example, the, the Suibyo on, on the left, uh, right on, on the tail of the horse, the Suibyo is the water jar uh, that 
uh, is a symbol for good governance, for example. So we see it also in the depiction of Fudo made by Enin, for example. Uh, we see many of those symbols, uh, which also, for example, if we go to the to the bottom on on the left, we saw uh, we we see the two statues of uh, Fudo and Eisen with many details that are similar, the hieratic face, the crowns on the top that Nietzsche also uh, draws uh, somewhere into the, uh, in the uh, Eisen depiction. So uh, the influence of Mikio uh, on, on Tendai teachings we know, uh, and of course Nietzsche was very influenced by Mikio, even though he criticized it uh, vehemently. Then uh, next to the statues, we, we see a uh, depiction of Kukai actually with his uh, nice uh, hoken, so his sword uh, <clears throat> who cuts the illusion. And we, we see the, the same uh, man in uh, dressed in a governmental attire, so to speak. And also we see the suibyo, the water jar. So we see similar uh, narratives then I would like to draw your attention at the at this uh, um, copy of a uh, treatise of of Kakuban, a, a, a sorry of Kakuzen, a esoteric monk. This is actually something that Nietzsche had copied, and if you look closely, you see we have the stupa of, uh, made of five elements. And if you have a chance to 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 see see all of these these the, the copies that made by Nietzsche, then, uh, for example, at the the at the bottom on on the left, maybe 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 I can enlarge it exactly. You can see uh, this one where I'm pointing with the mouse. Uh, maybe it's not very clear. Uh, <clears throat> these are actually uh, parts of the body. So uh, drawn into those shapes of the five elements stupa. So Nietzsche was already interested in the relationship between body parts, universal elements, and uh, and, and symbols and, and logographs and, and those kind of things. Uh, next to it, you see in, in, inside of the uh, lotus uh, petal shape is a uh, Amida mandala, which is also something that uh, Nietzsche copied. So uh, he copied those, <coughs> this is manual, so to speak, uh, of, of Kakoban. Uh, it is called uh, Gorin uh, Koji Myo Himitsu Shaku, so the secret interpretation of the five elements stupa in line letter mantra. This is still extant. It means that this, this work which Nietzsche has had copied as a student was very dear to him so that it remains, I mean, it's, it's uh, at uh, Nakayama Hokkegyoji, I mean, in the uh, curation of Nakayama Hokkegyoji, but it's actually, uh, I think, at the Kanazawa Bunko, and I think that there are even two of them uh, actually extant. So what I want to say with this is that Nietzsche had many, many influences. Uh, we don't have a proof of what he really saw, except the, 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 the things that he copied, of course, that he saw, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, but the other things, uh, we don't know if he really went to uh, Onjoji, for example, uh, where those drawings of, of Enin are, and that he saw them, or if he received some esoteric uh, transmission in Kyoto, as maybe uh, Lucia Dolce suggested. We, we don't know anything of that, uh, but it is definitely what we, we know is that those two drawings, uh, very early drawings from 1254, are still extant. It means that he kept them very dear. Another thing which I would like to say is that, as uh, Jacqueline Stone has exhaustively uh, explained in her uh, <coughs> defining book, um, the transformation of uh, original enlightenment in, 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 in Buddhism, uh, during the time of Nietzsche and, and he, even from before, at Endiagoji, <clears throat> so where he was a student, there was a hole uh, about, let's say, 800 meters into the wood, into the woods um, of, the, of, the main, of the main library. 
where he was studying, it was called the Ryozan Inn, so the, the whole of the Vulture Peak or the Eagle Peak. What was happening there? Uh, they kept a so-called living statue of Sakyamuni Buddha, a living in the sense that uh, this is a very Japanese concept, that the living statue. So basically, the statue of Sakyamuni was attended uh, by some 400 and more people, of course, on, on a rotation basis, uh, male and females, uh, uh, priest, clergy, and laity, they bring him food, they bring him water, people go to meditate, to pray. And what they did, they did this, <clears throat> how can I say, theatralization of, of, of the uh, Eagle Peak at the assembly in the air. Uh, they <clears throat> They uh, put some uh, uh, depictions of uh, Shakyamuni's main disciples. So, in a way, it was that people uh, who were meditating there or praying or chanting, whatever they were doing, they were doing so thinking that they were taking part at the uh, assembly in the air. This concept <clears throat> is a concept which was explained by. Uh, the historian Mircea Iliade, it is called the eternal return. Uh, the eternal return means that through ritual, uh, man, mankind can always return to a mythological uh, narration or to a myth mythological episode uh, through uh, ritual. A, a classical example, which most of Westerners know, is the Eucharistic. When you go to church to the mass, you have this, you know, uh, you have you have the prayers and, and the psalms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then it ends with with, with the priest consecrating uh, a piece of uh, I don't know how it is called in English, anyway, something edible, uh, and then he said uh, this is uh, he he consecrates the wine that he drinks uh, by himself, but maybe. In, in the past it was shared, so this is my blood that you are drinking, this is my body that you're eating, you know, uh, following the, the, the Last Supper <clears throat> episode, which is thought to have really happened or not, it, 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 this is not important. This is, the important thing is that through the, the, the ritual, uh, believers can always go back at any time to this Last Supper as a disciple of Jesus. Uh, and so the, the, the same thing was what was happening at, uh, at Ryozanin. So believers and devotees, they could always uh, go back to the uh, Shakyamuni's time, uh, Meta time, expounding the, <coughs> the Lotus Sutra at Eagle Peak, which is also, uh, it is actually a geographical location, but the Eagle Peak narrated in the Lotus Sutta is not a geographical location. It is a meta location in, in a meta time. So uh, we have, of course, absolutely no proof that Nietzsche uh, heard about this. He definitely did not, was not invited there because uh, uh, even if he was a priest studying at Enyakuji, uh, we have a list uh, still extant of, of people who, who, who went there. Uh, so we know that is always the nobility, that the Fujiwara clan, uh, princes, princes, uh, nobles. Uh, so definitely a priest of obscure origins and most of all uh, from the Kanto region, which uh, where people from the Kanto were considered backwards, retrogrades from the sophisticated Kyoto people. Uh, they were definitely not allowed. But we can make an educated guess that Nietzsche maybe have heard about it. We, we know, of course, uh, from, from his writings that Nietzsche had very, in Japan we say, very high antennas. So he, he, he was able to understand the zeitgeist, what was happening around him. Uh, you know, he, he was a very good listener. And so my educated guess that he would have probably at least heard you know, people <coughs> coming and going, <coughs> excuse me, this building, which was not far from where his dwelling was, was where he was taking the public lectures. Uh, he would most definitely have heard of it. So what I want to say is that Nietzsche definitely must have questions himself with, how can I render this? 
which is which is the uh, not which is the the the, the best or correct uh, uh, Honzon uh, focus of the version, which is the the best way to uh, to enable this this uh, something similar uh, of the eternal return, something similar to the how can I have the people go back to the not to the historical Shakyamuni but to the eternal Shakyamuni to this narrative of, of the Lotus Sutra, and. Uh, then I, I, I will go back to this, and uh, now we go to the next side, please. I take another jump now, and uh, I would like to talk about Hornen. Hornen, which is, of course, uh, uh, very, also uh, the target of Nietzsche's critique, uh, harsh critique. Uh, Hornen and Nietzsche were, you know, almost one century apart. And we can we, we could think by reading uh, uh, <clears throat> Nietzsche's writing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, or literary, so to speak, that they could have been enemies or anyway that they were two two different words. But wait a moment, uh, Hornen and Nietzsche, they studied the same curricula. Hornen was a Tendai priest, so the, all the practices that. Uh, Nietzschean learned, Hornen also learned. At the end, uh, Hornen, uh, after spending decades at, at, at the Endiakoji, or anyway, at the, the Heizan, uh, more precisely, uh, he became distressed because he thought that the defiled Mapo uh, era, the, the, uh, the latter day of the Dharma, that humankind is, is too afflicted by illusions, by afflictions, uh, the klesha, the, the bono in, in Japanese, uh, so that uh, the only uh, way uh, that he could save all humanity is to guide them into into the hand, in the compassionate hands, so to speak, of the uh, uh, Buddha of infinite light, so in, in, in the Buddha Amida, then after they, they, they pass away and, and the Buddha Mida will, you know, guide them to, to the Western paradise, then they will be uh, free of afflictions and then they could practice the Lotus Sutra and reach enlightenment. So uh, basically, he did not discard the Lotus Sutra in the way that seems to be uh, more harsh in, in, in Nietzsche's writing. The reality is, is, is a little bit different. Of course, when... Uh, um, Honin wrote his Nembu uh, Senchaku Chu, so uh, the Nembu Su Chuzen above all, which is also a target of Nietzschean critique. And during Honin's time, he was also harshly criticized, for example, by the monk Mioe, uh, the, the one who, who inscribed this, this mandala, which, which we have seen before. So there, there were uh, many people who, who went against this uh, Nembu Su Chuzen uh, above all. Uh, but one of the uh, greatest genial uh how can i say achievement of hornen was to concentrate all these long and painful meritorious practices which we have seen you know your your hair embedded in the mandala um, one character three bows uh, copying the whole canon and heavens knows uh, what kind of uh, complicated and, and painful practices uh, you know, like uh, chanting uh, many sutras and many, many things because th there was no fixed rule at the time. Uh, people thought, yeah, whatever has to do with Buddhism is a meritorious practice, so I'm going to do them all. But no, Nietzsche, then, uh, sorry, Honen concentrated everything in the single practice of Namu, devotion to Amida Buddha, so Namu Amida Butsu. And this is actually what uh, is in common with Nietzsche. And even if uh, Honen uh, was for the uh, Tariki, so the external power, and Nietzsche was for the Jiriki, own power. Uh, what they had in common, it was this uh, uh, concentrating everything into a single practice. Uh, we know, for example, in the in the uh, uh, writing that the, the, the wife of Daigago Sabuko, Saburo is, is, I think in English it's known the uh, uh, Gosho on, on menstruation, uh, where the where she asks him uh, when she's on her period, uh, sh should she refrain from chanting the sutra? Because in uh, Japanese culture, uh, 
women uh, during their periods they were they were uh, prohibited to to visit the shrines uh, uh, because of the the, the, the the whole Shinto narrative and then she said I, I chant such and such many time and I, and I recite this in this chapter etc etc and Nietzsche very humanly very nicely said uh, look uh, the period, the menstrual period is something extremely natural for a woman, so this is nothing to be uh, <clears throat> ashamed of, or there's no reason to, to refrain from, from, uh, from your Buddhist practice. And also, what I wanted to say is that I have never heard about anything about the practices that you do. So uh, why I, I quoted this is to say that during Nietzschean times, or also uh, people were not to say confused, but they were doing, you know, many different kind of practices. So Nietzsche also drew this idea from Hornen to concentrate everything into the devotion Namu to Myoho Rinkyo to the Lotus Sutra. And another thing is the idea of the savior. Uh, Hornen wanted to save everybody, the humanity in guiding them uh, towards the compassion of, of uh, Amida Buddha. And Nietzsche, of course, as we know, he saw himself as the Gyoja, as the uh, <clears throat> votary of the Lotus Sutra, because there are two concepts in, in Japanese. There's the Jikyo and, and, the, uh, and the Gyoja. So Jikyo means the one who upheld the Sutra. We could say this is the normal devotee. And the Gyoja so the, is, is the one who lived lives by the words. When Nietzsche wanted to prove that he is the uh, emissary of, or the envoy of, of uh, uh, Jogyo Bosatsu of, of the Buddha, and he saw uh, his, uh, the, the, all the difficulties that were uh, uh, showering upon him as a means to uh, transform uh, his karmic retribution. So he, he writes, I'm overjoyed that I've been exiled and, and this and that, uh, because in this way I, I can, uh, so to speak, polish my, my, my sins or my, my past karma. And also he asked himself, am I the water of the Lotus Sutra? But then who else lived uh, the twenty, the, the verse of twenty-three characters. He we will be persecuted by uh, by swords and staves. It was only me. So uh, he he overjoys that all these difficulties he which he was proactively looking for as a way to prove that he is the uh, uh, Gyoja, so the the, the the devotee, the the, uh, the practitioners of the Lotus. I I think. Uh, Dr. Yukio Matsudo, which is present somewhere in the audience, has, has written a beautiful book in English, uh, Nietzsche and Der Ausübende des Lotus Sutra, so in, in German, the, the practitioners of, of the Lotus Sutra. So in this way, Nietzsche then, again, I repeat, he could prove, he could establish his own uh, teaching without being just a sub-branch of, of, of the Tende school. We all know that uh, Shingon school, Tende school, any other school has many sub-branches as unfortunately also uh, the, the Nietzschean school. So <clears throat> back to Hornen, these two men had the same curricula and had many points in common. I have read a, a, a very interesting a small book, which I shared also with, with Jacqueline Stone, which was suggested by me uh, by the former librarian of Arisha University. It's, it's called in English something like Namu Mie Herenge Kyo versus Namu Amida Butsu. And it explains how much in common Nietzsche and, and, and Hornen had. So we could say, we could we can say if there were no Hornen, there were no Nietzsche as well. So Hornen is actually a, a very important person into the uh, Nietzsche uh, narrative. And then we go to the next slide, please. So, and now we are almost uh, drawing to conclusion. What we have here, we have here, as you can recognize probably very easily, we have uh, Fudo and Eisen and the five elements stupa. So this drawing is probably a little bit uh, after Nietzsche, 
uh, but what I want to emphasize, Fudo and the pairing of Fudo and Eisen with the uh, Gorinto with the five element stupa and or the Hojo no Tama, the wish granting jewel, uh, the food and Eisen are actually the red drop and the white drop. Nietzsche also talks about the red drop and the white drop. What are the red drop and the white drop? This is nothing else than the female ovulation and the male semen. So what does happen when the two meet? And you see in the middle is the five elements super. This is what happens when the red drop and the white drop meet. So <laughs> of course, the narrative is, is much more complicated. I, I, I try to uh, put it in a more uh, simple way. Uh, but anyway, the red and the white drop uh, generate life. Also, even in, in Europe, uh, in Europe's art and, and, and uh, uh, artistic conception, uh, day and night, male and female, sun and moon are two very profound archetypes of beauty. So uh, why I uh, show you this, uh, this picture is because uh, Nietzsche and uh, Food and Eisen, of course, we have already uh, demonstrated that were, they were very important for Nietzsche. And then we go to the next side, please. And what do we have here? Uh, many of you know, this is the first mandala drawn by Nietzsche and after the <clears throat> so-called incident at uh, Tatsuno Kuji, the, in, in Japanese, the Ryuko Honan, which is basically uh, just a, different pronunciations of, of, of the same Chinese character. So here, uh, after this iconic or catastic, uh, uh, fateful uh, night, whatever happened, whatever really happened, uh, something deep happened in, in Nietzsche's life because he, he was really convinced that he was going to die. And he was then uh, confined uh, for about a month uh, before going to Sado at the residence of uh, Homaru Kuro Simon, the constable of Sado. And he was there, and but still, even he was kept captive, he still could meet with people, he could send letters. And as, as we see as the evidence before our eyes, that uh, uh, Nietzsche could find two sheets of, this is two sheets of paper pasted together. I don't know if they pasted them later or, or, or they were already pasted together. Uh, Nakao Takashi, Professor Nakao Takashi said this is a high quality paper. So the, probably is someone like uh, Toki Joni or Soya Kyoshin, someone uh, of that milieu uh, gave it to him and he felt compelled to draw this mandala. Let's look closely. We saw, we see, of course, in the middle, it's obvious, it's Namu uh, Myoho Renge Kyo, and then on, on the left side, Nietzsche signs it. And then Shakyamuni and Tao, they are not present on this mandala. Uh, I, I see on the mouth, this is... Uh, Eisen and this is Fudo. So again, we have the graphic uh, uh, format of the depiction that we have seen before with logographs, with glyphs, uh, which is the concept of Nietzsche's mandala. So he basically draw the scene without using anthropomorphic depictions, but by drawing, uh, by, by inscribing characters. So uh, today, in this session, I'm going to show this mandala only. Uh, well, this is mandala is very important. Uh, for one, because on the right side, he puts the exact date and the place. So this moment in history is uncontrovertible proof that it's fixed in time. So we see this is a uh, year of Bune and day and months and, and, and where uh, is even uh, in sky where he wrote it. And then you see, uh, can we get a smaller please? Uh, you can see that actually uh, Fudo <clears throat> on the upper corner on the right is basically squeezed. So we can guess that Nietzsche inscribed this uh, the, the date and, and place before placing uh, Fudo and Eisen, because otherwise 
because uh, Fudo, the, the poor Fudo, so to speak, uh, re remained out of space. So, so he, he squeezed in, 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 the, in the upper right corner. Uh, so this is the unique uh, first mandala because all the other mandala, as we know, uh, th there is Nietzsche adds Shakyamuni and Tao to this. So, so somewhere at, at some point in time, at, when he arrives at Sado, uh, he changes or he reflects on 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 what to uh, depict on the mandala but this first mandala which is still on the main island so before prior to his exile uh, he still basically inscribe the same narrative which he has been reflecting already nearly two decades all around so from the time that he draw the two fudo eisen kankenki and the and the uh going into the five element stupa he substituted it with uh with the namu Kyo, with the five characters uh so he also in later writings he he write to for example to abu Subo, uh <clears throat> the body of abu Subo, uh five shakus or five feet uh tall is is uh is uh, etc etc so these are all things which draw back to the uh uh, this this uh, 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 manual which he he drew even before he became Nietzschean. Then uh, after this this uh, important episode in Nietzschean's life, whatever happened that fateful night at uh, Tatsunokuchi, and then his first mandala, he arrives to Sado, and we go to the next slide, and then we conclude. So here. Uh, about Sado, I, I would like to point out one point because in, how can I say, uh, uh, ceremonial, so during the sermon, the, the priest or whoever, you know, the, 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 the lay organization uh, uh, person in, who, who explains uh, the Dharma and the soil, he of course always depicts Nietzsche amid of the snow, uh, terrible difficulties, so that we don't even... And this Im image is, is so strong for us that nobody even ever tried to rationalize to um, how could have he survived, in, you know, if if we take this literally. Uh, but actually, of course, Sado was no resort island. He was not in a five-star luxury hotel. This is out of a doubt. But also, the narrative of the poor Nichiren, uh, you know, freezing in the snow, of, of course, you know, he wasn't comfortable at all. What I want to say is that uh, his group was already very well organized logistically and, uh, and, and with a very efficient system because otherwise, how could have he received paper, ink and brushes? Of course, we have the evidence of, we have the Kanji Honzon show. Uh, and this is an evidence, but also we have even more evidence because Nietzsche thanks, uh, you know, for the, the ink and the brushes and the paper that he has received. So if we see this uh, uh, this depiction uh, here on 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 the on the upper uh, left corner, here we see uh, Nietzsche and at, at Sado receiving the visit. Of course, it's a uh, legend of the celestial nymph. Uh, which uh, Ikitsushima, uh, which is another name for Shijimen Daimyojin, of course. So we already know when you talk about Shijimen, this is a Edo period uh, narrative. So, but this I I Ikitsushima uh, nymph, she rides on auspicious clouds and brings, so we see she holds in her hand uh, a piece of silk on which Nietzsche then. Uh, is supposed to inscribe the the first uh, uh, manda mandala inscribed in in um, extended style, which we also see here in this uh, very beautiful depiction in the book of Ogawa Taido in in the nineteenth uh, century, <coughs> which is one of the which was at his time in the nineteenth century a revolutionary book, which because it was the first book which was illustrated. And, but the text was not in difficult uh, Kanbun Chinese character, but it was in Kana uh, uh, characters, so in phonetic characters. 
so that even the uh, young women and uneducated people could read uh, about Nietzschean story. So uh, the role of the so-called Denkibon, so the narration books, uh, is has been always very important in in, in Japanese Buddhism and probably in, in every kind of uh, religion and narrative. But uh, uh, also, especially in Nichiren Buddhism, where many uh, famous artists and, and I wouldn't say painter because there were more uh, carvers uh, of, of uh, uh, xylographic uh, uh, woodblock prints, uh, they have uh, depicted and, and illustrated uh, Nichiren's uh, tales. So uh, in Sado, we don't really know in, in great detail uh, what, what happens except uh, from Nietzsche's own uh, <clears throat> autobiographical account. Uh, so much of it is, uh, is in the realm of legends. But something definitely happened in, <coughs> in, on, on Sado. We don't know if this first uh, Shiken Sado Daimandara uh, ever existed or not, because it's not extant anymore. Unfortunately, it was burnt down in the 19th century uh, at, at Kuonji. There are two uh, school of thoughts which are, of course, harshly debating. There's a, a Professor Hoku Kuana from Minabusan University who is absolutely certain uh, that uh, it existed uh, in Nietzsche's own hand at one time because it reflects the well, the text of the Risho Ankokuron. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, Kawasaki Hiroshi is of the idea that this is not possible because it was too elaborate and, you know, post facto, you, you, you can arrange, of course, everything uh, uh, for, from the uh, Kanjin Honzon show. So uh, this is not my area of expertise in the sense of uh, textual reading. Uh, maybe Jacqueline Stone is, is uh, probably <clears throat> more appropriate uh, or Lucia Dolce uh, to, to comment on that. And this is actually not the, the point of my research. And I'm, I'm going actually to to write my hopefully uh, PhD thesis also on the iconography and the iconology of those mandalas. But this is not the, the, the point. The point is that after all Nietzsche's career, uh, which we know from his uh, um, entering Seichoji uh, as a child, receiving uh, the Gammonjo, um, undergoing the, the Gammonjo ritual, uh, which also Saicho and also Kukai uh, uh, did, which is the uh, ritual where Nietzsche uh, explained that he re received from Bodhisattva Kukuzo this, uh, this famous jewel of wisdom, uh, because this uh, Gammonjo ritual was uh, supposed to uh, enable you to have a wonderful memory and exact and as a matter of fact uh, Nietzsche had a, at least a photographic memory because of course he he used text because we know that because he he asked Toki Jonin to send him the text on Sado because uh, without those texts he, he couldn't write anything uh, so another proof that they were a very organized and uh, efficient group but on the other hand he had a great memory which of course people at the time they didn't have tv they didn't have uh, computers and smartphones they have a, a way better memory uh, than we we human beings have in the 21st century but definitely uh, this rituals probably somehow helped uh, so in a nutshell what we talked about today uh, today uh, we <clears throat> we talked about uh, cave paintings, uh, relationship between sign and images. We talked about hokke art, the art of the Lotus Sutra. We, we talked about the, the image of the Buddha. Uh, we talked about Kukai and Honin. Uh, we talked about what might have inspired Nichiren. And then we jumped to the very first evidence of Nichiren's uh, mandalic work, so to speak. And, and we... We, uh, Fureta, we, we, we touch a, a, a little bit uh, on, on, the, on the Sado exile. But it is really after Sado that his mandalic career, so to speak, uh, really uh, boom and, and happen. So uh, next time uh, we will uh, discuss about the, the, the core of the research. Uh, the whole Nietzsche Mandali corpus, and in the third conclusive uh, session, we will uh, discuss uh, about hockey identity in, in the Nietzsche school. And this concludes my uh, lesson. I probably went, uh, yeah, 20 minutes over time. I'm very, very sorry, but um, I, I'm awake. I, I can take your questions if, if you will. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Luigi. That was phenomenal. We had a lot of wonderful comments, people thanking you for uh, the great presentation. Looking forward to the next round. Um, the first question up, um, Dr. Stone, you had asked a question or raised your hand. Did you want to... Um, did you want to comment? If so, I have enabled your uh, your speaker. Yes, okay. please. Thank you. No, I was I was just looking for the function where I could uh, applaud. So just let me do that verbally. It was a great presentation. It was so rich, and and what I especially appreciated is that you show uh, Nietzschean as. Um, embedded in uh, all the different uh, religious uh, currents, both intellectual and iconographic of his time, and that his genius was really in being able to crystallize these in the form of such an accessible practice. So thank you for such a stimulating presentation. Thanks, thank you, thanks, thanks uh, Jackie, for, for, for participating. I, I know you're very busy. Okay, uh, we had a bunch of questions. Um, that are queued up. Let's go ahead and take the first one. Van asked a question. He commented that uh, you had mentioned if there was no Kukai, there would be no Nichiren. Could you develop this just a bit? Uh, <clears throat> well, in the first place, uh, uh, Kukai was uh, revol revolutionary in a sense that he disentangled the Buddhist priesthood uh, from uh, when Buddhism arrived in Japan, you know, w w way more uh, before Kukai, it was basically uh, the priests were sort of like a, bureauc a bureaucrat. So they were serving the state because Buddhism were mostly uh, aimed at uh, praying for the uh, peace and security of the nations. Uh, so protections against natural disaster, which we know that Japan has plenty uh, volcanoes tsunami earthquakes and and the more the more the merrier so to speak so buddhism was basically mainly for the protection of the nation and of course for the well-being of the emperor because the emperor is the head of the of the uh, nation so if the emperor is ill the, the nation is ill so first he he was the first who disentangled buddhism in a way uh, from from this bureaucratic, from priests, from being priests and nuns, from 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 being um, like civil servants in, in a way, and uh, in this also, of course, in centuries later, enabled new Kamakura Buddhism uh, to uh, to create to give birth or to to give the rise to this new type of priest. So the priest as 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 we see today, uh, the priest who is uh, listening to the people, who helps the people, who do charitable work or something like that, that was not Buddhism at, at the beginning of Buddhism in Japan. That was something completely different. So uh, Kukai, dis first he disentangled Buddhism uh, from this uh, bureaucratic function. Second, uh, as, Nietzsche, as, as Nietzsche as well, <clears throat> Kukai was someone who based his entire career on, on the written word, and not only on the uh, uh, in the sense of writing some uh, exegetical work, but also Kukai did a lot of uh, art with uh, <clears throat> with uh, glyphs, with characters, with logograph. If 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 you are maybe uh, familiar with the uh, portrait of the eight Shingon patriarchs, uh, Kukai draws some uh, hihaku. It's called uh, hihaku characters, which is something like the, the flying characters in a way. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> Kukai was also someone who used visual art to spread his message. Uh, of course, with the mandalas and, and with his uh, calligraphic art. Uh, so we can say that uh, both of them based their whole career on 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 logograph on the moji in, in Japanese in Japanese is called the, the moji. Uh, so uh, if there were no kukai, uh, you know, uh, Buddhism would have been the, the old Nara schools about meditating and of course doing those uh, semi uh, magic uh, rituals uh, for you know uh, keeping away bad influences and and disasters. And, and this sort of stuff. So in, in a way, 
of course, the, their teachings and their career were very different because Kukai was not a, a priest as 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 Nietzsche in a way. Uh, the, the the young Kukai was was a sort of an outcast or the outlaw in a way. He was a very uh, talented young man who who went to study at the university at, at the time to study uh, Confucianism uh, to study Sanskrit, but at a certain point he didn't gra- he just dropped out he went into the forest to to practice uh, shamanism and uh, syncretic practices it's not really actually know what he has done but uh, Abiruichi, uh, uh who also wrote some fantastic books uh, about about kukai uh, he, he said that they, he wrote that they, they actually uh, how can I say tonsured him uh, b- before he, he he went to China? As in fact, he he went to China not as a, a state-sponsored <clears throat> uh, trip, but he went. He basically asked his father for 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 funds, and he went to <clears throat> to China uh, with uh, twenty years worth of uh, of. Uh, of gold or whatever was the currency at the time uh, to to stay in in Tang China to study for 20 years he actually came back after one and a half year or two years or uh, i guess and he sp- spent his all al- al- allowance of 20 years in bringing back all these uh, buddhist artifacts uh, to to japan so uh, the concept of uh, introducing the mandalas all, of course uh, saicho also uh, brought back a lot of mandala, but this is mainly the mandalas that Kukai brought back that inspired Nietzsche. And as in fact, he in in the Kanji Honzon show, he writes about those mandalas that Kukai brought to Japan, not not the other mandalas that that uh, Saicho brought to Japan. Although uh, Nietzsche is supposed to be in a direct transmission uh, with, uh, with 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 Saicho, uh, so in, in this way, in this sense, uh, we can we can fairly say. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, that if there were no Kuka, there wouldn't have been Nietzsche. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Um, next question from Anthony is, what was the significance of Nietzsche in signing and placing a date on the first mandala that you showed on screen? Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a nice question, but uh, the significance for us historians or <clears throat> scholars people who study is of course that we, we have incontrovertible proof that you know this this moment in time actually happened what was the significance for him uh we can only get frankly speaking i i don't have a a, a real uh <coughs> firm answer to that uh, but definitely he wanted to, uh, it was very important to him, as we have seen, because, you know, F- Fudo is, is basically squeezed on the on the upper right corner. So this was a very important thing for him. Uh, we also know that he put the date, uh, and, and also in the, in the early mandalas, he put not only the date, but also the, the location. I think that this, uh, in, in the... <coughs> Chronological order catalog, which is the number two, but, but we don't know if it's the second or if there were others before. But he also write, uh, inscribed, uh, inscribed on or drawn on Sado at that day, etc., etc. But the fact of putting the date was important for him for some reason uh, because um, in the early mandalas we, we don't have the date, but probably it was in, in the uh, on the backside as we see in many other mandalas uh, once upon a time. Uh, but then after a certain period uh, from, from the late Mune period, he always put the date on the mandala. In fact, most of his mature uh, period mandalas mandalas of the Kenji and the in the Koan period they are all dated. So it this was evidently very important for him. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we're almost uh, to 10.30, which is 2.30 in the morning your time. I can hear your voice starting to go. Um, I'm gonna probably see if I can just group a couple of these questions together. Uh, Lucas and Sarvash. I'm gonna take some, some water, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. While, while, well, actually, yeah, while you're going to do that, I want to just go through our announcements uh, real quick because we're uh, starting to um, lose some people. First of all, um, please do visit Luigi's website, uh, which has a link to the bookstore. Uh, it is posted in the chat if you will want to copy that link. Uh, this is the nitramandala.weebly.com uh, forward slash 
all of the material that Luigi is discussing here is covered in great detail in his books. I can't recommend them enough. Please do, do go to the bookstore and purchase those books. Uh, reminder to everyone that the United States changes from daylight savings time to standard time on Sunday, November 5th. That won't affect the next class, but it will affect the third class. The next class, part two, is Saturday, November 4th, same time as it was today, uh, still on daylight savings time. And then the third and final class is the very next week after that, uh, which is Saturday, November 11th that will be affected by the time change. So please double, triple, quadruple check your time zones. And then just as a reminder, the Nietzsche and Mandela Masterclass will be recorded. Uh, we will put it into post-production to clean it up. And then it will be made available on Nietzsche and Bay Area's YouTube channel at the conclusion of the third class. Uh, we do want to specifically thank uh, Luigi for uh, bringing this class to the world's attention. The material is so stimulating and interesting. Uh, I personally want to thank Reverend McCormick, the head minister of Nitra in Bay Area Sangha, for um, you know working hard with the Sangha to, to host this presentation. So thank you to everyone to do that. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and go back to uh, Luigi for questions and answers. Um, this one is really on my mind as well. So Lucas and Sarvash both ask, uh, where and why did Nichiren place so much emphasis on Aizen and Fudo when they're not part of the Lotus narrative? Um, and everybody kind of wants to know, like, what do they mean? You know, <laughs> some there's been some connection <clears throat> between Aizen and Bono Soko Bodai and Fudo and Shoji Soko Nehan, but nowhere in Nichiren's writings does he actually directly make that connection. So help us out. Um, <clears throat> look, uh, frankly speaking, the short answer is uh, we don't really know. <clears throat> <laughs> In sense, no, we don't really know because as as uh, uh, my mentor, Tadaoichi would say, uh, uh, game, he always used this, this word, game means to do it, if you want to be very precise, um, we really don't know because there is no uh, uh, writing of Nietzsche where, where he says, I, I put Fudo and Eisen on the mandala uh, for this and this reason. Uh, the reason, uh, what we can say about Fudo and Eisen and that we will see in the next presentation uh, next time is that they uh, reflect uh, as a mirror the zeitgeist, the situation that was uh, during Nietzsche's times, because we, we will see by, uh, if, if you see the, the in, entire Mandalic corpus, you see that Fudo and Eisen are very, very thin at the beginning. They, they're almost, you know, uh, tiny uh, at the sides, you know, elongated, you know, like, like just two uh, snakes or, or, or something like that. But then they grew bolder and bigger because Fudo and Eisen have a protective function. This is the reason why uh, they, they are on the mandala. Uh, they have a protective function because uh, they are promised to, as also the, the four heavenly kings, uh, that they that they will uh, uh, protect the, the, the Buddhist practitioner. As a matter of fact, we see that uh, once the Mongol uh, the Mongols start attacking and, uh, you know, uh, gearing up for the second attack. And then also we have the uh, persecutions on uh, Nietzschean followers uh, in, during the incident at Asahara, for example. Around that time, uh, which was not a, a, an easy time, but not only for Nietzschean devotees, for all Japanese, because they were sending all the warriors uh, to Kyushu in the south to build the wall, you know, to contrast those those barbarians uh, which were arriving, those, those warriors, the, the Mongols who were trying to conquer Japan. So people were really afraid. On top of this, uh, there were also, you know, uh, the Kamakura magistrate, uh, Taira no Yuritsuna, so we may, most of you know as Heino Simon, which was directly in, in you know involved in a, he had a grudge uh, against Nietzsche for for uh, previous uh, situations so he was you know uh, 
uh, uh, trying to because he couldn't attack Nietzsche and on on at, at Minabo anymore, so he was trying to head it on on his followers. So people were afraid. As a matter of fact, we see, but that I I, I would like to uh, explain next time. So ju just a spoiler, we see at a certain. Uh, in a certain period during the Koan era, that uh, the central inscription of the Daimoku, it becomes disproportionately smaller and Fudo and Eisen are much bigger. This does not mean that uh, Fudo and Eisen uh, suddenly are more important than that the, uh, that the Dharma, that the, 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 the Daimoku itself. It is just that uh, the, the mandala is a three-dimensional scene so that you can zoom out basically as if you have a, a camera or an ob a teleobjective that you can zoom out so that the object which is more far uh, appears more small so and, and then you see that like a uh, Fudo and Eisen, which are the, the guardians of, of, of the palace of, of the of the uh, assembly in the air, they appear bigger and bolder because they are more near to the observer. Because the observer, as we will explain, uh, see the next time, is already inside the, the, the scene of, of the of the uh, <clears throat> assembly of the air. Uh, so this is the uh, Fudo and Eisen are there for a uh, uh, protective function. Uh, this is the the, the 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 main reason. But if, even though you know, we, one could argue, yeah, well, of course, you you, you have the the four heavenly king. They, they are protective enough. Uh, why does uh, did Nietzsche feel the urge to continue to uh, place uh, two figures which have nothing to do with the uh, Lotus narration? And he also emphasizes it because they are in fact inscribed in in Siddham and in in, in uh, Sanskrit characters not in in uh, Sino Chinese logographs uh, so this was also how can I say uh, puts puts them away from from the rest of the scene but you know all, all these details we will see in the in the next presentation okay great uh, do you have the uh, uh, energy for two more questions sure bring it on <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Michael asks um, about the parallels between mandalas and the meditation practices of Buddhism and how they may have evolved together. Mm. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, I can say what well, you know, I, I, I took once a <clears throat> A meditation class, not in the sense that I learned to meditate, because I'm, uh, as you can see, as an it is, uh, <coughs> Italians are very bad meditators. Uh, but uh, on the history of meditation, because I was very curious, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, the early Buddhism, so Theravada, and so anyway, the, the early Buddhism was all about meditation. So how? Uh, in in a way, uh, when it when when Tinda, when Shikan meditation, or what what is Shikan meditation? And what what uh, how you know those uh, su saffron robed monks, which we know from the Sravasti uh, school and or, of thought, etc. How, how in in China it suddenly it it, it became the the Shikan meditation and the Tenda school and and how we then arrived to 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 Nichiren etc and uh, what is very interesting is that uh, uh, so the shikan <coughs> meditation is is uh, shikan uh, means uh, come from uh, sat and pass so sat means stop and pass means uh, to to uh, um, meditate to contemplate so so the shikan meditation is is a two uh, stage uh, to two, two element meditation so one is uh, stopping uh, unnecessary thoughts in in a way and and the other one is to to contemplate on 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 the on the ten realms and this is a very complicated uh, type of meditation as a matter of fact it it, it didn't it, it was difficult for for most of the people to to uh, become involved this, in this type of meditation but this was exactly uh, the 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 turning point so to speak uh, when the this uh, theravada meditation or this uh, early from, from the, the school of the elders so to speak from india uh, how uh, how it changed it to to the kushan empire and and, and arrive to china <clears throat> and and become the shikan meditation so 
the relationship uh, with the man mandala is, um, I mean, meditation in a broader sense, uh, like uh, Zen meditation or so, uh, I, I don't think that uh, most of the meditations uh, per se need an, a, a focus of devotion as, as far as I know, but I'm, I'm not very keen on, on, on meditation. Uh, but <clears throat> the relationship with the mandalas is that, for example, in the uh, in the esoteric mandala, in the Mikyo mandalas, uh, such as in the Taizokai, in the Kong, the womb, and in the, the diamond, as, a, as have we have seen before, is that the practitioner meditates on the various uh, panels uh, of, of transformations, uh, knowing, of course, the, the, the narrative. So the, the mandala is, is, a, is a journey within yourself, so to speak. So it's, it's a tool that, that helps for, for meditation. And in this sense, there is a relationship with the fact of the Nichiren mandala is, um, of course, more easy to understand, and as we will see in the next time. So spoiler again. So uh, for the uh, the observer or the practitioner, or the meditator, because, you know, the, the, the Daimoku practice is, uh, is, is uh, this is uh, the field of the study of, of, study of Dr. Yukio Matsudo, uh, as he correctly see uh, uh, the practice of Daimoku as a form of meditation, because meditation, I guess, doesn't need to be silent uh, to, to be meditation, so you can meditate also while you're chanting uh, a, a mantra, for example. So in that sense, the the honzon, the focus of devotion, the focus of respect is something that helps you to anchor your your meditation. Uh, this is also something uh, very basic in the, in, in, in the human uh, mind. Uh, for example, Stonehenge and, and you know, many uh, totems of Native Americans and, and uh, any kind of sacred image uh, is a help to, to the journey within yourself uh, to, to contemplate. So basically prayer is a, is a contemplation, this, this notion of uh, prayers as in give uh, external uh, force, give me something. Uh, this is uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, a misguided conceptions, which also uh, within the Nietzsche community is, is uh, this conscience of this uh, um, seeing uh, the prayer as, as a means to you know like a slot machine you know uh, to, to 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 receive some some merits or some benefits uh, so to speak uh, this this vision is, is perhaps a little bit uh, misguiding uh, to the practitioners uh, perhaps so uh, in, in a way also the 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 practice of the daimoku is a form of meditation of contemplation uh, because you drift away from your worldly things of uh, um, shopping list and feeding the cats and this sort of stuff, uh, rather than what is really important is in, in your life. This is what you meditate uh, about when you pray or, 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 or you pray when you meditate, wherever you, you want to see it. So uh, the mandala is, is, is really a tool who helps you, is, is a roadmap, so to speak, to a journey uh, within yourself. Great. Thank you. Okay. Last question from Krista. She said, phenomenal presentation, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, her question is the first mandala that Nietzsche wrote on Sato. What material was used and how difficult was this type of material to obtain? Uh, also, does this particular mandala, is it still extant? And if so, where is it? Uh, and mm -hmm. then the decorative blue gold frame, was that added later? Um, <clears throat> okay. Um... I'm not, I'm not sure which one that you're talking about, but uh, I, I I believe if you oh sorry you you're talking about the decorative blue frame. So uh, the mandalas, all of them, at the beginning they were not framed. Uh, they were just uh, pieces of of, of paper. Uh, devotees usually uh, the Nietzsche group they they did. Uh, the mandalas, uh, I mean, the, the paper by themselves, uh, Nakao, Professor Nakao Takashi uh, uh, suggested that there must have been some uh, paper expert uh, among the Nichiren group, but basically uh, they, they uh, um, 
processed uh, um, mulberry, mulberry tree and, and, and bark and, and paste it in a basic papier mache as, as, as we have done as, as kids. And then they produce this, this uh, highly durable paper uh, by themselves. Or in other cases, you know, some more wealthy patrons, as, as we will see next time. Spoiler again. Uh, they provided already some high quality paper decorated already uh, with, with with some decorations. Uh, so the, this blue frame, uh, which which you have seen in in the picture, <clears throat> this was added. Uh, Professor uh, Nakao says probably uh, they were framed about uh, a couple of centuries after uh, they they were produced. And he suggests that at the beginning they were um, attached to some rods uh, at the temples or at the proto temples at the early Hokkaido, the, the prayer halls, because he still found some metal particles on the backside. Uh, on the other hand, uh, my tutor. <laughs> Uh, Terauichi will say, uh, if we have to be very precise, we, we don't really know that. But anyway, uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I think uh, Professor Nagao is, is very no knowledgeable and, 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 and one of the top experts worldwide. So I'm, I'm sure if, if we say this, this is uh, definitely true. So they were basically attached to the rods and la just later they were, um, how can I say, Framed in the in the form that we know today, with, 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 with as a scroll that that, that 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 you can you know close and and uh, whirl up uh, upon it itself. So uh, I I think that you are uh, talking about the, the, this mandala. If we're talking about the blue frame, uh, this mandala is still extant. The, the picture is mine. I, I I took it in 2007 at uh, uh, Liu Hongji Temple in in Kyoto. How it landed there. Uh, we, 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 we can talk uh, uh, about an hour a day, but we don't actually don't really know. Uh, it is probably uh, <clears throat> because of, and th there are two uh, extra Nichiren writings, one to Nijo King, Shijo Kingo, and one to Ikigami Munenaka, uh, extant at the same temple. So we can guess that it arrived there through the Ikigami connection or to the uh, uh, Saburo uh, Yorimoto connections, I mean, Shijo Kingo and, and, or, or Nichizo that we don't know. Uh, but uh, this is definitely extant. And you can see it uh, every in, in August. Uh, the dates change sometimes. So if you happen to be in Japan <coughs> during the period of August and, and go to Kyoto, you, you can even see it. And, and the photographs was was taken with, with, the, with the priest's permission. You can even, I mean, you don't touch it, but you, you, you could theoretically if you wanted to. So Ryoonji is extremely permissive and hopefully that they will continue to do so uh, and that some... Uh, lunatic uh, won't, won't try to do something strange so that at that time that they will of course put it at, at least under glass and some and, and not freely uh, available like it, it is now uh, so uh, if you if you mean the uh, so the, so uh, again this mandala as uh, professor nakao said it was done on uh, a high high grade paper uh, produced in the Kamakura period, these are two sheets pasted together in, into one. And uh, if, if you talk about the uh, Shiken uh, Sado mandala, so the first uh, legendary, uh, uh, I dare to say because it's not excellent anymore, the, the first uh, uh, mandala in extended style that Nichiren supposedly uh, inscribed on Sado, uh, it was uh, on, 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 on a silk, uh, on, on a special uh, Kempon silk uh, uh, made especially for, for paintings and not, not for, for clothing, so to speak. Uh, it was um, <coughs> said to have been stored at uh, Minobu-san until the 19th century. Uh, and unfortunately, it was uh, burned uh, together with the Kaimoku Shou, the original Kaimoku Shou, the opening of the eyes, uh, and another copy of the Rishuan Kokuron uh, and, and, and many other writings and mandalas which were there. Uh, so, 
we uh, what we have today is is a copy a transcript uh, more than one actually uh, transcript uh, from uh, Abos from Kuonji and as I said before there are two schools of thought and I'm not going to enter into this if this answer your question yes thank you very much Luigi uh, we're so grateful um, thank you very very much uh, quite late your time and to everyone who joined today, thank you so much for being here. Uh, please remember these are recorded. They will be made available at the conclusion of all three classes that will be on our Nitra and Bay Area YouTube channel. And uh, if you enjoyed the session, please consider a small token of uh, Donna on our website, as well as go and visit uh, Luigi's bookstore uh, and purchase his books and encourage your friends and fellow practitioners to come to next time as well. So spread the word. Thank you so much, Luigi. Really appreciate your time. We'll see you all in two weeks. With that said, be well. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be well. And may you be peaceful and at ease.